Hello and welcome back to Intro to GPS. In today's video lecture we're going to discuss accuracy, precision, and GPS error. So on that note let's dive in. So accuracy is the closeness of a measurement to reality. So for example horizontal accuracy is of more interest than vertical accuracy which is the altitude for say cadastral mapping or surveying. So the nature of the global positioning system with the satellites above the user leads to this vertical accuracy, this altitude levels that are going to be one and a half to two times greater in error than horizontal accuracy levels. In this class, we're only going to be really concerned with horizontal accuracy, not accuracy during, uh, relative to altitude. Precision is the closeness of measurements to each other. So let's take a look at this. So the images above here are used to explain the differences between accuracy and precision by comparing three targets that were repeatedly shot with an arrow. So accuracy describes the closeness of arrows to the bullseye at the target center. Arrows that strike closer to the bullseye are considered more accurate. The closer the system's measurements to the accepted value, the more accurate the system is considered. So to continue with the analogy, if a large number of errors are shot, precision could be measured by the size of the arrow cluster. When only one arrow is shot, precision is the size of the cluster one would expect if they were repeated many times under the same condition. While all errors are grouped tightly together, the cluster is considered precise since they are all stuck close to the same spot, even if not near the bullseye. So the measure are precise, though not necessarily accurate. So GPS data collection devices have varying levels of accuracy and precision. For example, the Trimble Explorer, Geo Explorer series has both high accuracy and high precision, while the Trimble Juno 3 series, which we use in this class, has low accuracy and high precision. So the average of the collection of measurements is more accurate than any individual measurement by a factor equal to the square root of the number of measurements provided the data follow the Gaussian model and are normally distributed. So don't worry, you're not going to be doing any calculations. Uh, you simply need to understand a collection of measurements is more accurate than any individual measurement. So let's kind of take a closer look at this. So in this image, shows one hour of GPS data, and the data shows the beginning of a clear normal distribution, which is outlined in the red, uh, which indicate is this red, and then the GPS points are indicated in the blue. So this is one hour sample. This is a 12 hours of data, and we can see a clear gain in accuracy. Notice that at 12 hours, the normal curve and the GPS data are close to being one and the same. The general picture here is that the longer a GPS collects positions for a point, the more accurate it is. However, there is a limitation to how long you would stand in one place to collect positions. In this class, collecting 30 to 40 positions is sufficient. So the GPS has been designed to be nearly accurate as possible. However, there are still errors. Added together, these errors can cause a deviation of plus to minus 50 to 150 meters from the actual GPS receiver position. We'll take a look at most of the more significant errors. The three types of errors are satellite, receiver, and atmospheric. Within each of these error types, there are specific errors that can occur. We'll take a closer look at these errors in the following slides. So GPS position calculations, as discussed here, depends on a measurement mean signal transmission from the satellite to the receiver. This, in turn, depends on knowing the time on both ends. So Navstar satellites use atomic clocks, which are very accurate, but can drift up to a millisecond, enough to make an accuracy difference. These errors are minimized by calculating a clock correction at the monitoring station and transmitting the corrections along the GPS signal to appropriately outfit the GPS receiver. 
So a GPS signal has passed through the atmosphere, the ionosphere, it's about 50 to 100, 50 to 1,000 kilometers above the surface. Signals are delayed and deflected. The ionosphere density varies, thus signals are delayed more in some places than others. The delay also depends on how close the satellite is being overhead, where distance that the signal travels through the ionosphere is least. By modeling ionosphere characteristics, GPS monitoring stations can calculate and transmit corrections to the satellite, which in turn pass these corrections along to the receivers. Only about three quarters of the bias can be removed, however, leaving the ionosphere as the second largest contributor to the GPS error budget. So here we have the upper atmosphere of the ionosphere, 5 to 150 meters of accuracy um, error. So the GPS receivers are equipped with quartz crystal clocks that are less stable than the atomic clocks used in the satellites. Receiver clock error can be eliminated, however, by comparing times of arrival signal from two satellites whose transmitted times are known exactly. So satellite orbit refers to the satellite's ephemeris. It pertains to the altitude, the position, and speed of the satellite. Satellite orbits vary due to gravitational pull and solar pressure fluctuations, and orbit errors are also monitored and corrected by the master control station. So the ephemeris is compiled for each satellite and broadcast with the satellite signal. So GPS receivers that are able to process this ephemeris can compensate for some of these orbital errors. And so the GPS receiver calculates coordinates relative to the known location of the satellites in space and a complex tax that involves knowing the shape of the satellite's orbits as well as their velocity, neither of which is constant. So the GPS control segment monitors satellite locations at all times, calculates orbital eccentricities, and compiles these uh, deviations in documents called this ephemeris. An ephemeris is compiled of, for each satellite and broadcast with the satellite signal. So GPS receivers that are able to process this ephemeris can compensate for some of these orbital errors, as I said earlier. So the three lower layers of the atmosphere, the troposphere, the tropopause, and the stratosphere, extend from the Earth's surface to an altitude of about 50 kilometers. So the lower atmosphere delays GPS signal, adding sl uh, slightly to the calculated distance between the satellite and the receiver. So signals from the satellite close to the horizon are delayed the most since they pass through more atmosphere. So the more atmosphere that the satellite signal has to pass through, the more chance that it's going to be uh, bent, refracted, and so forth. So I'll let you take a second here to read these slides here. The troposphere is the electronic neutral atmospheric region. It is uh, non-descriptive for radio frequencies as a result of the delayed in the GPS signal. Measured satellite to receiver ranges will be longer than the actual range, depending on temperature, pressure, and humidity. These all, all affect uh, the air, dry component, 90% of the delay is easily modeled and can be resolved using two receivers simultaneously. Wet component, the water vapor, is not easy to predict, meaning water vapor in the air. Next, we want to look about uh, multipath air and, and how much air is received or is caused by this varies. So ideally, GPS signals travel from the satellite through the atmosphere directly to the GPS receiver. In reality, GPS receivers must discriminate between signals that received directly from the satellite and the other signals that have been reflected from surrounding objects, such as buildings, trees, and even the ground. Antennas are designed to minimize interference from signals reflected from below, but signals reflected from above are more difficult to eliminate. One technique for minimizing multipath error is to track only those satellites that are at least 15 degrees above the horizon. So this is a threshold called the mask angle. Multipath 
air are particularly common in urban or wooded environments, especially in those where there are large valleys or mountainous terrain, and are one of the primary reasons why GPS works poorly, or not at all, in large buildings, underground, or narrow city streets that have these tall buildings on both sides. So if you have ever been geocaching, hiking, or exploring, and notice poor GPS service while in dense forests, you're experiencing multipath error. So ways that we can kind of uh, limit GPS uh, error is, or limits the GPS in itself, are inside buildings, it does not work. Underground, so if you're in caves, it won't work. Under heavy tree canopy, it won't receive the signal. Uh, around strong uh, radio transmission lines causes problems. And urban canyons, which is kind of shown here in the two right images, where you'll have a lot of um, interference from bouncing off the, the buildings, or you won't see enough satellites because you're kind of blocked in these areas. So how to avoid these areas? Point averaging, meaning collecting more and more points for a position. Mission planning, which we'll talk about, which is about kind of understanding when is going to be the optimal time to go out and collect GPS data. Don't collect data in a downpour. This causes some kind of interference. Around strong radio transmissions, as I said, avoid collecting data around reflective surfaces. So in addition to avoiding all these um, things are a good idea if you want to get as accurate and precise data as possible. On that note, see you next lecture.